Welcome to Motivation at Hand, Ma. To know is to know how. Part 8. Case 123CR00257 TSC Document 139 filed November 6, 2023, in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America v. Donald J. Trump, Defendant. Government's omnibus opposition to defendants' motions to dismiss the indictment on statutory and constitutional grounds. b. The defendants' constitutional challenges lack merit. b. Alvarez confirms that the charges in the indictment do not offend the First Amendment. The defendant devotes many pages electric case filing, ECF, number 113 at 4-10, 15, to discussing the Supreme Court's decision in United States v. Alvarez, 567 U.S. 709, 2012. But Alvarez undermines the defendant's argument and confirms that the conspiracy, fraud, and obstruction charges in the indictment are entirely permissible under the First Amendment. Alvarez held that the Stolen Valor Act, which made it a crime for anyone to falsely represent that he or she had been awarded a military medal or decoration, was facially invalid under the First Amendment, 567 U.S. at 715 to 16, see it, at 730, Breyer, J., concurring. In a plurality opinion, Justice Kennedy contrasted the Stolen Valor Act, which targeted falsity and nothing more, with laws that implicate fraud or speech integral to criminal conduct, which prohibit false statements in connection with some other legally cognizable harm. 567 U.S. at 719 to 21. In language that has direct application to the charges here. The plurality opinion specifically identified as permissible under the First Amendment laws that protect the integrity of government processes, quite apart from merely restricting false speech. Such as perjury, prohibitions on false statements to government officials, and prohibitions on falsely representing that one is speaking on behalf of the government. Same as at 720 to 21. The plurality opinion further confirmed that where false claims are made to affect a fraud. Justice Breyer's concurrence similarly contrasted statutes like the Stolen Valor Act that simply prohibit without limitation the telling of a lie. With narrower, valid statutes that apply to a subset of lies where specific harm is more likely to occur. Same as at 736, see same as at 734 to 36. As an example of one of these narrower, valid statutes, Justice Breyer specifically mentioned fraud statutes, which typically require proof of a misrepresentation that is material, and statutes forbidding lying to a government official, which are typically limited to circumstances where a lie is likely to work particular and specific harm by interfering with the functioning of a government department. Same as at 734 to 35. In other words, the government may protect its processes and functions against fraud and corruption carried out through lies. The statutes charged in the indictment are precisely the sorts of laws that the plurality and concurring opinions in Alvarez identified as permissible restrictions on false speech, in contrast to the invalid Stolen Valor Act. The conspiracy, fraud, and obstruction offenses charged in the indictment implicate fraud or speech integral to criminal conduct, and they protect the integrity of government processes, quite apart from merely restricting false speech. 567 U.S. at 721, Plurality Opinion. Alvarez thus forecloses a First Amendment challenge to the indictment. C. Concord Management and Consulting LLC, 347 F Supplement 3rd at 56, denying motion to dismiss Section 371 charges after Alvarez. The defendant nonetheless erroneously contends that Alvarez supports dismissal. He relies, ECF No. 113 at 4, 7, on statements in the concurring and dissenting opinions that hypothetical laws restricting false statements about philosophy, religion, history, the social sciences, the arts, and other matters of public concern would present a grave and unacceptable danger of suppressing truthful speech. 567 U.S. at 751, Alito, J., dissenting, same as at 731-32, Breyer, J., concurring. 
but the statutes charged in this case do not impose restrictions anything like the hypothetical laws mentioned in Alvarez. Nonetheless, the defendant suggests, ECF number 113 at 7 to 8, 12, 15 to 17, that his statements about the 2020 election are like those hypothesized in Alvarez because he gave his opinion about what he describes as a widely disputed historical, social, and political question. Same as at 15. Footnote 12. Although the defendant is not charged with merely expressing his opinion on matters of public concern, he is wrong to suggest that statements of opinion may never be false. The expression of an opinion not honestly entertained is a factual misrepresentation. United States v. Amrep Corporation, 560 F. 2nd 539, 543-44, 2nd circa 1977. Statements of opinion may trigger liability for fraud when they are not honestly held by their maker, or when the speaker knows of facts that are fundamentally incompatible with his opinion. United States v. Paulus, 894 F. 3rd 267, 275 6th circa 2018. The expression of an opinion may carry with it an implied assertion, not only that the speaker knows no facts which would preclude such an opinion. Omnicare Incorporated v. Laborers District Council Construction Industry Pension Fund, 575 U.S. 175, 191, 2015. The indictment belies that assertion, showing that the defendant's lies concern not philosophy, religion, history, the social sciences, the arts, and the like, 567 U.S. at 751, Alito, J., Descending but instead concrete, specific statements that he knew were false, see, ECF number 1 at paragraph 19. 36,000 non-citizens had voted in Arizona, paragraph 33. More than 10,300 dead people had voted in Georgia, paragraph 41. An illicit dump of more than 100,000 ballots in Detroit, paragraph 46. There had been 205,000 more votes than voters in Pennsylvania, Paragraph 52. There had been tens of thousands of unlawful votes in Wisconsin. That proving he committed fraud through false statements would be akin to dictating what he is required to believe. C. The indictment does not improperly restrict political speech or discriminate based on viewpoint. Starting from the faulty premise that he made only statements about political matters of public concern entitled to absolute protection, ECF number 113 at 12. The defendant contends, same as at 7 to 11, 15 to 16, that the indictment should be dismissed as impermissible viewpoint discrimination. That argument is without merit. The First Amendment's prohibition of viewpoint discrimination does not foreclose the government from charging the defendant, or any other defendant, for committing crimes through false statements. Falsity is not a viewpoint. If it were, any statute that prohibits fraud, false statements, or the like, would be invalid on its face. Nor does the indictment discriminate against the defendant based on viewpoint merely because he is charged with committing fraud using false statements about the 2020 election. That many of the defendant's statements about the 2020 election were related to political matters of public concern does not insulate his false and fraudulent statements from the application of the criminal law. It has long been established that words alone may constitute a criminal offense. Even if they spring from the anterior motive to effect political or social change, United States v. Freeman, 761 F. 2nd 549, 551, 9th circa 1985. Notwithstanding that political speech and religious exercise are among the activities most jealously guarded by the First Amendment, one is not immunized from prosecution for speech-based offenses merely because one commits them through the medium of political speech or religious preaching. Rahman, 189 F. 3rd at 116 to 17, C. United States versus Turner, 720 F. 3rd 411, 420 to 21, Second Circa 2013. True threat unprotected speech even though it pertained to political matters. United States versus Amaui, 
695F.3D457, 482, 6th Circa 2012. Forming an agreement to engage in criminal activities, in contrast with simply talking about religious or political beliefs, is not protected speech. United States v. Hassan, 742F3rd 104, 127 28, 4th Circa 2014, same, Concord Management. And Consulting LLC, 347F Supplement 3rd at 56. Rejecting claim that charge of conspiracy to defraud the United States infringed on free speech rights because the defendant engaged in political speech the defendant invokes ecf number 113 at 12 to 13 the supreme court's decision in mcdonald versus smith 472 us 479 1985 to argue that his conversations with government officials were protected under the petition clause of the first amendment footnote 13 the Petition Clause provides a constitutional right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. U.S. Constitution Amendment 1. But that case in fact confirms that speech is not immune from the application of criminal law simply because it concerns a matter of public importance. The petitioner in McDonald had sent a letter to multiple federal officials, including President Ronald Reagan that allegedly contained false allegations of illegal and unethical conduct by the respondent, who at the time was under consideration for a position as a United States attorney. Same as at 480-81. Rejecting the petitioner's claim of absolute immunity under the petition clause. The court held that the petition clause afforded the petitioner the same amount of protection as the speech clause and therefore he could be held liable for defamation which lacks First Amendment protection. Same as at 482-85. It made no difference that the letters addressed matters of public importance, namely the qualifications of a candidate for United States Attorney. Same as at 486, Brennan, J., concurring. Likewise, there is no basis here to treat fraudulent statements or statements integral to criminal conduct any differently simply because the statements pertain to matters of public importance. Footnote 14, although the defendant cites and briefly discusses, ECF number 113 at 13 to 14, McDonnell v. United States, 579 U.S. 550, 2016, that case lends no support to his First Amendment, or any other, claim. In that case, the Supreme Court defined the statutory term official act as used in federal bribery statutes applicable to public officials, with which the defendant is not charged. The court adopted a narrow construction in part to avoid constitutional problems. Identifying a substantial concern that a broader interpretation would cast a pall of potential prosecution over. The normal relationships between officials and constituents that are an important part of our form of representative government. Same as at 574 to 75. The court did not mention the First Amendment in its opinion, and the opinion provides no support for the defendant's claim that the First Amendment provides him with a right to commit fraud. To be continued. Part 9. 2. The Fair Notice Doctrine does not provide a basis for dismissal. Much appreciation to you for giving of your time with us at Motivation at Hand. To know is to know how. We trust you will come back soon.